I have a very special guest on today's episode of Crystal and Corked. I am so excited that my doctor and friend, Dr. Michelle Wolford, is here to share so much wisdom and information with you. We have such an open and honest and raw conversation about a lot of things. We are talking about courage and death and sexual assault and a trend she's seeing with some patients of wanting to change and pivot. You know, 2020 has really created that for a lot of people looking at their lives differently and forced to kind of change and pivot. So um, she's got really great advice and just a great conversation around that. We talk about social media and developing technologies and what that is doing on children and just kind of a conversation around kind of the negative sides of social. And we also, Michelle leaves us with a great and easy tip advice that I think is so doable for everyone. And I think so important. So make sure you tune in and listen to the entire episode. This is an episode I'm going to be listening to again. Uh, before we dive in, I just want to share a little bit more about Michelle. Dr. Michelle Wolford has ran a successful private practice in Encinitas since January of 2011, treating children and adults for a variety of acute and chronic conditions all over the world. She's traveled the world collecting information for your healing experience, working with top medical doctors, shamans, gurus, and healers. She has a remarkable way of intertwining her Western medical training and knowledge with her profound Eastern medical training and knowledge of plants, energy medicine, nutrition, body movement, meditation, breath work, and spirituality. Her life purpose is to inspire, inspire others to live their life with authenticity, integrity, and responsibility for the enrichment of their life and those around them on purpose with optimal health, fulfillment, love, and vitality. You can check her out at drmichellewolford.com, which of course we will link to. And let's dive into this awesome episode. Hello, I'm Crystal Vilkaitis. I'm a curious, wine-loving entrepreneur who loves to learn and have open and honest conversations. Join me and my amazing guests as we talk about all sorts of relatable business and life stuff. It's my goal that you'll have fun, learn something new, and get inspired. Wine is not required, but is recommended. This is Crystal Uncorked. Dr. Michelle Wolford, I am so incredibly excited you are here. Welcome to Crystal and Court. Thank you so much. I can't wait. I'm excited. I know. I, know. I mean, this show, <laughs> I, this show, I mean, we're going to talk about it, but you have an influence in me actually starting this show. Before we share this story, what are you drinking? Oh, yes. Well, this evening I am drinking Blanca. It's a Vino Verde from Portugal. Ooh. So for people that don't know much about Vino Verdes, it is a white wine. It is generally very crisp. Um, and they pick the grapes when they're still uh, like immature, when they're still green. So it creates a little bit of like a sour flavor, Ooh. but it's so smooth and it doesn't have like the deep butteriness of like a Chardonnay. It doesn't have like the minerality that you always get with like a Sauvignon Blanc. But anyways, I haven't tried this one. I'm very excited. Oh my gosh. Love, love, love. Okay. I'm going to have to try that because I've never even heard of that type of wine. That's amazing. Yeah, it is amazing. <laughs> okay. I hand selected this. Okay. You sent me a good wine recommendation and I just didn't make it to the store to go get it, which I was bummed because that would have been really cool to try your wine recommendation, which was, it was star starmont mont starmont yep. <laughs> um so i'm gonna link to it still on this page i'm gonna try it it will be on a future episode maybe when you come back because i feel like you're gonna have to come back because i feel like we have a million and ten things to talk about um but i did choose this wine today so this is burtek family vineyard have you heard of this one michelle because they have I don't a no let me see the they, label i don't think i have, have. Well, it might be blurry. I kind of have to like hold it here. But so okay. they actually, it's a brand new winery and they're in Encinitas. No way. Yes. So oh. I picked it because that is where Michelle is. And I am too, kind of, I'm in Oceanside. So it's a local vineyard, super small. Um, they do these really cute tastings. It'd be really fun if we go together sometime. I'm going to do an episode from there, but their wines are 
amazing. So I have a cab. Um, these grapes were grown in Napa, but they are growing grapes in Encinitas, if you can believe it. Like pretty, pretty cool. Wow. Um, so cheers. Oh, wait, I got to pour mine first. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> okay. And so the Europeans, half of them are still doing corked and then the other half have moved to caps, which is very strange, but. <laughs> oh, interesting. <laughs> cheers. Clink. <laughs> mm. Is it How good? is it? How is it? Mine's delicious. It's like what you want to drink on a hot summer day. Have Which you're probably feeling glasses. a little bit in. Um, wait, you're in Houston right now, right? I am. Yep. I'm visiting my family in Houston right now. I just did another interview and he is in Houston. Oh, no way. How funny. I, I should need him for wine. <laughs> I, seriously? <laughs> you guys just could have been in the same room. We just did a little, <laughs> a little collective thing. Mm. Um, how funny. Okay. So when Michelle and I were prepping for this, actually, no, I wanted to share this story because in my very first episode of Crystal Uncorked, I talked about how it's been a few years that I've been wanting to do the show. And I then started meeting with Michelle. I've been working with her since my, before I turned 30. So it's been like six or seven years. I'm going to be 36 in June. And I originally went to Michelle for acne. So she made me stop eating dairy, which totally <laughs> helped. It was like all gone. It was amazing. Um, and then I had a, I had like some stomach issues. So we figured that out. And gluten is just not my friend. And But then it's like, then I start opening up about business issues I'm having and issues with employees and money blocks I'm having. And I'm like, holy shit, we are doing a lot of work together, like <laughs> a lot of work together. So, um, I started seeing Michelle again towards the end of last year in 2020, just feeling stuck with different things in life and also just some stomach issues again and energy issues. And, um, we were meeting in February of 2021, just a couple months ago. And I share with her crystal and corked and she loved it, was so on board. And she's like, so why aren't you doing this? It was just like, what are you waiting for? Do you need permission? Like she was just asking me really great questions. We got to the core of it. I had a major aha and I left there being like, the next time I have an appointment with Dr. Michelle, my show's going to be live. And it was March 14th. That show was live. And here we are. You are on the show. So it means so much to have you here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Oh, so much. Um, okay. So when we were prepping, we, um, there was a lot of things that came around courage and I feel like that might be a through line today, but we're going to have this very open fluid conversation. And one thing that I often think about with you, because I've seen it with me results in my life is that you get to guide people to these breakthrough moments and to create change in their life in so many different ways, which must be really fulfilling. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us a couple of examples of patients where you've helped them, like some of those more fulfilling, memorable patient stories? Yeah, absolutely. Um, two immediately rushed in. Um, I do treat a lot of children. About 50% of my practice is pediatrics. And then the other half is adults. Um, and a lot of my pediatric patients, I mean, maybe it's like behavioral issues, rashes, allergies, stomach issues. But I also do see a lot of like vaccine injury. And um, I would probably say those are some of my most like amazing cases because you get kids that have all of a sudden now been put on the spectrum because they've, you know, had a reaction to a vaccine. Maybe they stopped talking and they haven't spoken in three years. Maybe now there's like so much inflammation in their body because of how their genetic expression and their whole ecosystem responded to what was being introduced to it. So with a lot of inflammation, maybe they're like constantly hitting their head or banging it against a wall. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen all gamuts of that expression. So to be able to unwind that, you know, inflammatory response and that negative response and kind of bring a kid back, bring them back into their body and getting them talking and laughing and loving and touching and mm -hmm. being a kid again. I mean, it's one of the most rewarding things out there because parents feel like they got their kid back, you know? Yeah. I can't imagine being a parent going through that. 
And just yeah. that, I mean, you just want your baby to be okay. I'm sure. Yeah. Right. And you'll do anything to make that happen. And I feel like, um, I mean, I've never been in that situation. I am not a parent. I do have some friends who have kids with special needs and, um, but yeah, you will do anything. And sometimes they don't find people like you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, that's what breaks my heart. Um, but this is where this is platforms are great to have these conversations to know different alternatives. So that's amazing. Um, yep. what is another one? You said a couple came to your oh, head. Yeah. So it was one of my first five patients. And, you know, when I'm working with a patient, I'm working on the physical, the biochemical, the energetic, and, um, and it's usually a combination of all three, but sometimes it's like, you can really just treat somebody with like energy based medicine, or sometimes you really do have to get just into the physical body or, you know, kind of try to change things biochemically. But this is one of my first five patients that I ever had when I opened up my brand new practice in Encinitas um, literally top five, like one of my first five patients wow. and she came in and she had digestive issues. So she was referred to me by her yoga instructor. But when she walked into the office, she was wearing all black. She didn't even really acknowledge me and she was knitting. And I was, I remember being like, Oh my God, like, what do I, what do I do? Like, do I call her out on it? Do I just let her do her thing? Like, right. But she wasn't engaging with me. And I was really kind of taken back by that. Um, so of course I just kind of kept asking questions and trying to hold like a really safe space for her. And, um, you know, she just wasn't into understanding, like we talked about physically what needed to change from a dietary perspective and what herbs I wanted to give her and why to kind of help what was going on digestively. But when I had brought up that oftentimes when people have digestive issues, it's because they're having a hard time like digesting the outside world. So not just mm -hmm. physically, right? Like the food, but maybe emotionally, and man, she just was not having it. Um, but what came up in this is that she lost her uh, partner, um, her husband, I think it was like 12 years ago, maybe it was 10, but I think it was about 12 years ago. And she was still going to grief groups. And I was like, okay, this is a problem. Like missing somebody, okay, but still in the grieving phase, like 12 years later, not okay. So, um, and it was interesting. I started to notice this, this pattern. She was going to a different grief group every three months. She would change groups. And cause it was like, she was addicted to needing to tell that story and to be in that emotional experience. She would go three days a week and there was this patterns of threes. So I gave her a homeopathic remedy called Ignatia. And it's good for people that get stuck in grief who really need to move past that, right? You don't want to like take somebody out of their natural like evolution of like emotional like experience, but she was past that. So mm -hmm. I gave her um, Ignatia and I said, I want you to take three pellets three times a day for three weeks and come back. And so she walked into my office three weeks later. She's wearing this like colorful, bright Hawaiian like dress. Yeah. And she's like, I quit my job. I'm moving to Hawaii. <laughs> she didn't have her knitting stuff with me. And I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like that is the power of natural medicine. You wow. know, when somebody's ready for it and the body's ready for that message, that whisper, mm. um, you know, and we surrender into it, like magical things can happen. Oh my God. I have full chills because that is the, it, you do have to be ready for it, right? Yeah. Like you do have to surrender to it. Um, that being one of your first five patients of this woman in black <laughs> knitting, I mean, must've been like, what, what am I getting myself into? Like what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Um, it's so awesome. I mean, that's what really keeps me yes. going is like watching people transform, you know, right oh. in front of you. You uh, seriously, I feel like you must see so many transformations. I feel like I've gone through so many transformations with you. Um, so cool. Thank you for sharing those stories. Yeah. Um, okay. So we, we, as we were like briefly talking before the show, we were talking about some of our topics and such, and we were talking about death mm -hmm. and I feel like this is kind of a perfect time to talk about it because this patient was grieving for 12 years, yeah. hanging on to her partner. And I have to be so honest. We also talk a lot about astrology. I love astrology. <laughs> um, you're super into it. I'm a newbie, but I have a loaded eighth house. So I have an eighth house is death and also um, like money uh, from other people, like other ways of making money, not your own income. And so it talks about how 
I will experience death on a really deep level. And Mm. I'm really nervous about that because I haven't really experienced death in my life. Mm. I, my dog bruiser died, which I also worked with you on because that was really hard for me. And you gave me some support during that time. Um, Dustin talked about losing his parents on episode three. And so it's something that I don't feel like is, it's not talked about much in my life because I don't have much of it, but let's go there. Let's talk about, I'm really going to put this a little bit open-ended on to you, volleying to you of, as we were prepping for this, we were talking about from a COVID perspective, we saw a lot of death. There was a lot of death in a lot of different areas. I want you to just kind of elaborate on that and let's, let's have a conversation about that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I've, I've traveled all over the world. Like I just, I love people. I love cultures. I love learning. I love traditions. And I find that, um, more so in American culture, and then I'll expand that into Western culture, which leads into more of the European realm. We just don't talk about death the way a lot of other nations talk about it. And it's, I feel because we don't have those open conversations, it's very feared. And I don't know if it's maybe a lack of faith in something, you know, I'm not here to tell people what they are to believe in, but, um, maybe it's, you know, not believing in a greater purpose of life, even let's just keep it that simple. And so we become very attached to this present day existence and, um, and we hold on tight. And so the thought of death just becomes very scary. Um, the unknown becomes very scary. And in that, you know, to, to your point, what you said, it's not just about a physical death, like somebody truly dying and leaving their human body, but you know, the loss of a job is a death. The loss of your innocence is a death, the loss of an animal, a friend, um, you know, even like a relationship, you know, breaking up, like, I mean, there's so many different types of deaths that are out there. Like a loss of your identity is a death. Um, and so I don't know that we're like super equipped. We don't talk about it a lot as a culture, you know what I mean? And it's like, we don't praise the cycles and the ebb and flow of life. It's like, we really just shine a light or a spotlight on, you know, the peak and the pinnacle of success. And we don't really look at the whole like evolutionary path. And because of that, I think death is really hard for people to comprehend and to navigate. Right. Yeah. So what do you do? Like, (laughs) you know, what do you do? (laughs) Totally. Well, so I lost my father 10 years ago um, on May 14th. So that's, I'm in Houston visiting my family for Mother's Day and um, to celebrate, you know, his life and his legacy. Um, And... You know, like when a patient comes in, obviously holding the space and talking is super powerful. There are plant-based medicines, um, like herbal remedies that can support just keeping the body in rhythm so that the nervous system doesn't go into a place of shock or too far out of balance. So it's not about somebody not experiencing their emotions. It's about keeping them grounded so that they can really authentically have that experience and that cathartic release. Um, and then energetically, you know, there's a lot that you can do with like flower essences. I mean, there's mantras, meditations. I mean, the list goes on. Um, so, I mean, that's definitely how I support my patients or even my friends, you know, let's say you're not in to see me as a patient. Um, you know, in the moment for me, when my father had died, I really dove deeper into my spiritual being. Um, I think I've always been a spiritual person, but I needed to find, um, I don't know. I, it's like I needed to be energetically connected to him, even though he wasn't physically here so that I could, I not like cognitively make sense of it, but just really like feel how I was going to move through this somewhat alone because my mom's experience is different than mine. My brother's is different than mine. You know, anybody who's experienced a death, like your own story is so uniquely your own and how it impacts your life is so uniquely your own that you know, quite honestly, I think it's about diving deep into your heart, having a deep sense of self, having a deep sense of purpose and knowing thyself is what makes people unstoppable and unshakable. And so whether it's a physical death or whether it's a loss of a job, um, you know, a loss of a relationship or, you know, whatever it may be, a loss of freedoms, whatever it may be, like understanding who you are, what you want, what you believe in, where you come from and aligning with your truth, I think is what makes people resilient to those types of experiences. Yeah. 
No kidding. And yeah. I, I have to imagine it's obviously a process. Like it definitely takes time. That does not happen overnight, but you have some support to really work through it. I remember with you talking energetically to connect with your dad, Dustin always talked about how he just felt kind of like he was an orphan, even though he was an adult. Now both of his parents have died and he felt really alone in that aspect. I don't think he's done much of the energetic work that he could do to feel less of that. Um, But I mean, I could see where that could be really helpful. What is your dad's name? My dad's name is Steve. Steve. And, yeah. Steve. Tell us about Steve. Okay. Oh my gosh. And that's such a great question. It's like, nobody asks that anymore. I'm like, I don't even know what to say. So my father was, um, he loved educating people. So he loved to learn and then he loved to educate people. Um, he used to tutor like inner city kids that were like struggling with school or, you know, wanted to have that extra support, but maybe didn't. Um, every time we traveled, it was like, we had to see every battlefield, go to every museum. It was like, Oh dad, really? Again? <laughs> um, Love it. He was an avid tennis player. I come from a big tennis family. Um, so that was kind of our family activity. Um, and he was just such an interesting man. Like, I don't know. He was just such a great man. We would just do some of the most interesting things. Like we'd go like fly fishing and we would go fossil hunting and look for like gems. And he just, he loved earth, you know, like, like just like the physicality of like earth. Oh my God. I love it. Yeah. And he sounded, he kind of sounds curious, like with wanting to learn and discover things. And he sounds a lot like you, that's for sure. You know what? My father and I are very similar. My mom yeah. and my brother, I have, I think a little bit more similarities and my dad and I, we were like kin- kindred spirits. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, cheers to Steve. Cheers to Steve. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay. I love it. So let's, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about, cause something that I love talking about that I'm finding that I like to talk. I think that there might be something to this in my future about confidence and courage, but I'm figuring it out. I'm just letting the show go and, and see what happens. But I have a lot of interest in courage and confidence and okay. how people can find that. And I want to know from you, when is a time where you really needed to be a little more courageous than normal? Mm. Let me think about that. You know, I've had a lot of, I've lived a lot of life. (laughs) It seems like, and maybe that's part of being like a doctor, healer, like advisor is I've had a lot of, you know, different life experiences. Um, I would probably say a time in which took a lot of courage and you wouldn't think that it would, um, was, it was probably about two years ago. Now I was sexually violated, um, by, I went in to go get like a massage, like healing session, completely passed out on the table and not to be vulgar on your show, but woke up to the man's fingers in my vagina. And, um, I was just, I was kind of like in this like state of shock. Um, you know, I felt like it was a safe space. Like I felt like I could relax. It is somebody that I had seen before. Um, you know, we have no dating history, no sexual history. There was no drugs, alcohol, nothing involved. I mean, it was like a really like I go, I, you know, pay somebody to go in for a session. And, um, in that moment I was just so taken back and I was like, you know, what do you do? So I just responded very calmly. Um, obviously said that, you know, was very inappropriate, left, called the next day, was like, this is inappropriate. And then I was like, you know what? I need to call the police because if this is happening to me, it could happen to anybody else. And I know that there are younger girls that come over and see him. Um, I had referred some patients to him. I mean, the whole thing, I was just like, and at first it kind of felt like I was being a little dramatic by going to the police. And then I'm like, you know, uh, as a kid, I was actually sexually molested and my molester got 60 years in prison. Um, yeah. So I was like, you know what? Like it, 
it's got like, yeah, somebody has to come forward. Exactly. You know? Yeah. Um, and quite honestly, it wasn't until I didn't even really tell anybody. Um, and I, it was like maybe a week later I was having a uh, lunch with a girlfriend and she's like, that's sexual assault. And I was like, what? She's like, that is sexual assault. Yeah. And when she said that to me, I was like, you know what it is like stuff like this happens all the time. And so, um, yeah, I mean, to be able to go to the police off, you know, to, to the police, to be able to tell the story, um, I knew the person. So in a way it almost mm -hmm. felt like I was turning in a friend, you know what I mean? Um, and I'm just one of those people where I'm like, you feel like you can work anything out with people, you know, yes, I had had a conversation with this person. Of course he guaranteed he had never done that to anyone before. Then this was interesting. He turned it on me and was like, look, if you never want to see me again, like I understand. And that's what a lot of perpetrators do. They make mm -hmm. victims feel bad about what had happened um, so that they it, it like it's a psychological trick. Well, it turns out um, I started reaching out to some of my patients and just being like, I need to, you know, know, have, right. were you violated? Um, and another woman came forward. And so she went to the police as well. And um, yeah, I mean, the story goes from there, but it was, I would say that was a really challenging thing. You wouldn't think it would be challenging, but because it wasn't some heinous, like I got beat up in an alley crime, you know, it's like, right. I think too often we just let those things slide because I don't know, we feel like we can handle it or it feels like a lot to go turn somebody in. But the problem is, is that and I don't think enough people are turning people in for things like this. And so quite honestly, I spent about, gosh, I don't know, a year dealing with the DA and, um, and the whole court system. And it's like amazing how even in that realm of things, investigator, police, DA agents, et cetera, kind of also view it as like, well, you know, you weren't raped and beaten to death. So, you know, so we're, we're like, we need to step forward, man, woman, mm -hmm. whoever, however you identify yourself as, if you have been violated, like, you know, I just think it's important to, to step forward. Yeah. Well, I think the easier thing is to not, right? Yep. It's to, and you don't, I'm sure I've never been in that situation, but I'm sure you don't want to relive it. And probably every, if you do step forward, you have to relive it a lot because you have to yep. go through details and it's a, it's a battle. It sounds like it was a battle. If you're dealing with the DA for a year, I mean, that's crazy, but yep. it's not okay. Like yeah. it's so not okay. And I'm so glad that you did have the courage to move forward because to your point, like, you know, it's not just happening to you, yeah. you know, like, so I hate that you went through that. Um, I'm glad that you did something about it. What ended up happening then to him? So that was really, really interesting and extremely disheartening. So the, the, what the detective told me was these are really hard cases to prosecute. And, um, and so he's like, it is the state of California versus this individual. And, you know, it's so funny because I had to do a wired call. I had to like read all these scripts. This guy confessed to it on a wired call. He confessed to it, you know, in, in so many ways, I shouldn't even be giving these kind of tips out right now, but it's like, he had confessed to it in so many ways. And the DA was like, oh yeah, this is a hole in one. And then when another victim came forward, he was like, yeah, this is definitely a hole in one. And then it just got dropped. And I was like, why? And they were, they basically had said that the system was very overloaded and they needed more victims to come forward. I asked how they end up finding more victims and they say, we don't look for them. They have to come to us. And, um, unfortunately I, you know, sometimes the law can be really great, but sometimes it can't. And I don't share this to discourage any women, um, you know, because of course what I'm saying is very discouraging, but the truth of the matter is, I think if more people do come forward, then it will be taken more seriously. Um, but basically they felt that they had more heinous crimes that were easier to nail people and to move forward. Um, insane. it is insane. Yeah. And so it's like, I mean, where I know that I have the tools to take care of me, like I know I'm going to be okay. But there are a lot of people that are, won't be emotionally stable after that situation or 
maybe sexually feel, you know, different or, um, or not trust people. Or, you know, I think about like the 16 year old girl that lives across the street from him that hangs out with him. You know what I mean? And I'm like, you know, parents are never home. You got a 16 year old girl that just wants a little bit of love and intention. And she's hanging out with an older gentleman who, you know, clearly has no problem yeah, like taking advantage of people. Right. <laughs> so, right. so, you know, that's what makes me, I think, more concerned. Yeah. So it's the case is still open. The case is still open. They just need more victims to come forward. Wow. Yeah. Well, that does show you, I like that you said not to discourage anybody, but really, I mean, it is, you have to be courageous. You do have to step up it can help in maybe situations where you don't even know that there's already a case for this, you know, yep. like you might not even know and you're supporting it, but oh, thanks for sharing yeah. that, Michelle. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's really important for people to, you know, honor yourself, honor your body and, you know, stand up for your worth and your value. And, you know, a violation is a violation. Yep. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. One thing that I think COVID has done for people, and I really think this because of what you have said to me in one of our appointments was people are asking themselves like what they want, what, like, who am I and what do I want out of my life? Like we all got flipped upside down the whole world did. And so we're just asking different questions and looking in, I think. And that's something that I experienced of, I mean, you said one of my most favorite things and I'll probably do an episode around this. I feel like I want to write a book around it or a based on it, but you know, I've done social media for so many years and it's kind of like just who I am. And I've been wanting to not just be social media and you're very great with analogies. Um, and you were like, yeah, it's like, you've been wearing the same dress for 12 years and you want to wear a new fucking dress. And I'm like, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <are> you coming? <laughs> I want a new fucking dress. <laughs> um, and so, you know, but there, a lot of that has come out from this. And so my, because you've mentioned it in the past of you're seeing this with patients, I would love kind of a glimpse in your world of what you're hearing from patients. Like if you are seeing this need to do something else or to pivot our lives? Like, do you feel like we're in this kind of changing moment? Absolutely. I mean, so the way I look at the world is very similar to the human body. It's on, on layers. So there's that like etheric, you know, a non-tangible energetic space, which can go for miles and miles. And then you start to move into the mental and then the emotional and then the, you know, biochemical, like the earth is physically going through a biochemical change. We have laid so much concrete on this earth that it is looking for a breath. So you will see over the next six to seven years, more volcanoes, more hurricanes, more tornadoes, more tsunamis, because literally the earth is searching for an inhale and an exhale without Mm -hmm. all of the armor or concrete. Just like it's like wearing a freaking corset. The earth is like, can't breathe. Right. And, um, and then, you know, physically, so I look at earth the way I look at humans. And I think that we are trailing next to each other on similar cycles. And I don't know, for me, I felt like I saw it coming. I didn't know it was going to be a pandemic. I didn't know how it was going to happen, but I could just feel that people were starting to get itchy in their life, even if they didn't realize it. And you, I could see it in, in the earth. You could see like, you know, our coral reefs are dying and our forests are being deforested and like everything has been asking for a break. Humans have been asking for a break. All they do, they feel like they do is work. The earth is asking for a break because all we do is overwork it. And, um, you know, it's in a way it truly is a blessing in disguise. And that isn't to sound unsensitive to anybody who may have lost somebody during this time or lost their job or so forth. But the truth of the matter is, is, I mean, I've experienced a lot of different types of traumas in my life. And one thing I've learned through every trauma is that it's an opportunity for greater growth. And in that greater growth, you learn more of who you are. You learn more of what your passion is, your purpose, and, and your place here on earth and what you like and what you're attracted to and where you're misaligned versus where you're actually aligned. Mm-hmm. And I really felt like this gave the globe a reset. Like it really gave us an opportunity to dive deep within. Unfortunately, a lot of people didn't like what they saw when they dove deep within. 
And that's okay. But right. it's an opportunity. Like, you know, it's somebody flashes a mirror in your face. If you don't like what you see, you can't just put the mirror down and walk away. Like that image will even stick with you. Like it's an opportunity to say, okay, how can I shape shift? How can I pivot? How can I change? How can I transform? How am I thinking that's no longer serving me? And how can I think differently where I can really live the life that I want to live? You know what I mean? Like even with crystal and quartz, it's like, doesn't mean you have to give up everything else. It just right. means that you're wanting to evolve into a greater version of what you've already created. Right. And, um, sure. For some people, maybe that does mean that they, you know, they get the divorce, they move out of that state, they, whatever, they get at rid of that job. But uh, oftentimes maybe it's just, it's like an opening, you know, into, into a greater expansive space that includes what is already serving you. Right. That was a big yeah. aha for me. I felt like I had to choose. Like I can only be this yep. or something else, which was, a you know, now is really silly looking back on it. But I think that we just get so stuck in our way. You know, yeah. it's just like, this is how I do life. This is how I do life. And we're so in, you know, it's like this close where we don't have that time to really reflect and, and look at the bigger picture. And I feel like that's what COVID kind of helped people do because they had more time and, and also, you know, dynamics change, kids are at home, everybody's at home, like the yeah. world shut down. So it, you're forced to just ask different questions. But, um, it's, I, I, I think, you know, I'm somebody who loves change. I thrive off of change. So it was very exciting to see some of that. And I feel like there's a lot of innovation that comes out of that. And Absolutely. I just hope that people do, stay true to them. Like any, any advice or, you know, I'm sure you have a million things that you could share and it so depends on like who you're talking to, but any kind of advice to help people really be courageous in yeah. sticking to who they are and what their heart wants. So there's two pieces to this. I'm going to talk about people with kids and then people without kids. And then the answer is actually the same. I just, there's a caveat to the kid thing. You've got to know who you are. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't know who you are, then start reading, start trying new things. Like you got to get yourself out there. I don't care if you're an introvert or you're an extrovert or you hate reading, you know, today there's no excuse. You can listen to podcasts there. Everything's on audible. You can read, you can, you know, you can work anywhere you want in the world for the most part. I mean, the excuses that people come up with, like, you just got to get rid of them. You got to be brave. You got to be bold and you just got to go for it. And the truth of the matter is, is that it takes an element of trust. And if you are doing, if you are aligning with your higher purpose, if you have, if you're, okay, let me back up. If you are approaching life, I, I have this thing, it's called air authenticity, integrity, and responsibility for the enrichment of your life and mine. If you are living in authenticity with integrity for the, with responsibility for your life and mine, and I'm, I'm taking responsibility for my actions, my thoughts, my words, then life will always support you. It just will. I mean, I've had, I've lived on food stamps and I've flown in private jets. I mean, I have lived the extremes and I've had no money and I've had tons of money. And it's like, and that's just like a money example, but it's like life will always take care of you. And so even when you're doing, if you're making bold, bold, bold decisions and you're just like, oh my God, what am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? You're just getting further and further away from your comfort zone, which is where the magic happens. Mm. That's where the unknown comes in. And that's where you can't manipulate and control and the universe, a greater power, serendipity, flow, whatever you want to call it kind of starts to step in. So if people can know who they are, and if you don't know who you are, start exploring things to know who you are. Um, and if you can have a little faith and trust, and then if you can just believe in yourself and love yourself, like the world is your freaking oyster. You can do anything. You can go anywhere. You can do, you can just, I don't know what else to say. <laughs> You're like, I mean, but hey, amen, girl. No, you, that's like, I love air because you need air to live. Right. Yes. And you need yeah. exactly what you're, oh, I love it. Love it. Love it. Yeah. Um, I feel like I was more trusting in my twenties and also yep. there's an element of being naive. 
Uh, I think, you know, you're just kind of like, I'm young and I don't know any better. And so I'm going for it because I feel like I really would follow my heart and do so much more when I was in my twenties and now thirties, I'm like, I spent a lot of time thinking about stuff. And like, for example, I am so pulled to live in New York city. I, and we talked about astrocartography yeah. in our last. So that night I went on and did this whole astrocartography for Dustin and I, and New York city is a magical place for both of us. And I've always been drawn there. <laughs> I'm alive when I am in the city. And so now I'm on Zillow every morning looking at properties and we did buy a house in Colorado. We're supposed to move to Colorado in February. And I'm like, my family's going to kill me if I'm like, Oh, we're going to rent it out and go to New York, but <laughs> we'll see. I know. Are you accountable to this? <laughs> I know. I know. I, it's, but like, it's really, I can't explain it, but yeah. then there's so much doubt. There's like, how, you know, there's just so, I feel like when you get older, so many more things come into your land. And you were going to talk about kids. Actually, I want you to go back to that because that's a piece of this too, of like being able to follow your heart and really go after it. What was the side from a kid perspective? So I will get to the kids, but it's interesting. Okay. I think the reason it's harder the older people get is one, we're more established. Two, we have more expectations of who we mm -hmm. are and where we're supposed to be. And yeah. so to uproot your life, when you're in your 30s, 40s, 50s, I would probably say in that time frame, because you're expected to be established and successful and have reached certain milestones and markers, you know, there's a lot of like the ego really has to die. There's a lot of fear in letting things go and rebuilding and recreating. So yes, it can be harder to unwind, but two, I think it's that, it's that expectation of who I am, where I'm supposed to be and how established I'm supposed to be. Um, but again, I think if people can get over that and just be like, if, if this is my life, like, and this is all I've got, you know, and nobody else freaking matters. Like, what would I go for? Go for that. That's what we should be going for. Yeah. Um, and then, okay. So then the kid thing, so we don't forget is, you know, so often I hear parents say, I can't do that. I've got kids. And I just want to be like, bullshit, bull fucking shit. Because kids, one, are so malleable, they're so adaptable, and two, yes, they get to an age where they start to give you a little bit of attitude, but the reason that, actually, this is like a psychological like phenomenon, the reason that kids around the age 12, 14 start to like get this attitude and want to distance themselves from the family, it's actually genetically programmed in us because it's about widening the gene pool and repopulating the earth. So... It, you like, you're not special. Like, you know, every kid is like that and that's okay. And that's a good thing. But if you start to like keep the family unit strong, like the more roots somebody has, the greater wings that they can have. So mm -hmm. if in a household, you know, we've gotten so far away from like the family unit sitting down and having a meal together. And even if everyone's sitting around the table, they're usually on their phones doing their own thing. So if families could take 10 minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at night, and either sit together in silence, meditate, like everybody do a group share about their day. I know that can sound a little too woo woo and kumbaya, but the problem is, is we have completely left truly connecting in with people from our hearts. We're all up in our heads or we're working from our root chakra, those kind of lower vibrational energies that went out of balance is all about survival. And so it's not about connecting in community. I mean, in balance, it's about connection and community, but out of balance, it's like, I got to finish this paper. I got to set off this email. I got to call this person. I got to have the best outfit. I got to get the new car. And so I think families who like poo poo the idea because they have a newborn baby or they've got teenagers or whatever. I'm just like, no, no, no. That's an even better reason to do it because you've got a group of little people that you're trying to instill greatness in so that they can be a successful contributing member of society. Like you want to instill this, this connectivity in them and this groundedness so that they too have a deeper sense of self so that when they spread their wings in the world, they have more direction, they have more purpose, and they can be more impactful that way. Yes. Oh my God. I love it. I love yeah. that so much. I, you know, I'm not a mom and I don't plan to be. 
Um, but I have always thought about when I hear that too, thankfully my friends are pretty open with their kids. I will say this so makes me think of my friend Heather, which I want to give a shout out because I know she listens to the show. Heather, I love you. She has four kids and four four, and she's my age and on her 30th birthday, her and three kids, dad, her husband and their nanny flew and her twin brother, Tracy flew to California to see me with oh, their no three way. to see that with their three children, but they brought it like they figured shit out. And she wanted they went we went to Disneyland together, which was amazing, and wine tasting and all sorts of fun stuff. But like they are not afraid to travel. They will go, they will make it work, they will do it. And she doesn't have that limitation of, but I have four kids. Yeah. She just is like, I have four kids you know, and let's make it work. I want to go. And I've always thought that that's an amazing, like if you're feeling pulled to do that, isn't that an amazing lesson and to show your kids, you know, of like really living in your truth and not having boundaries and figuring stuff out and making it happen where, you know, my, we never went anywhere as a kid. We went to Iowa cause my mom's family is from there but my dad never wanted to travel. Like it was just, we stay home. We don't go anywhere. My mom really wanted to travel. So there's like, I learned from that, right. Of her sacrificing and not doing it. And so I never wanted to be like that. I really wanted to live in my truth. And, but yeah, I'm, I I just, I love this conversation. I think that it's pretty, uh, And I could see people with kids being like, who the fuck are you to say? Like, I can't go and do that. I mean, and to your point of there are excuses. I really do feel like if there's a will, there's a fucking way. And and a lot of parents don't give their kids responsibilities. I mean, when I was growing up, like Mm -hmm. we had chores and it wasn't just like, empty your trash can. It was like, we were learning how to do our own laundry. We were responsible sometimes for grocery shopping. We were responsible for, you know, making meals. I mean, everybody was on rotation so that we could be a part of the family unit. It wasn't about mom and dad providing, you know, everything for us. Yes. They were financially providing for us and, you know, and providing in other ways, maybe like emotionally or driving us to sports or whatever it may have been. Um, But wherever we could be a contributing member of the family unit, you better believe that we had to contribute. And if we didn't, then we didn't get some of the privileges like hanging out with our friends, you know, being able to buy an outfit for school or whatever it may have been. Yeah. I love that being a contributing member. Yeah. Um, I wonder, you know, and again, like I'm, I can't really talk. I don't have kids, but from, I have a lot of fears about social media there. It does a lot of good, but it also does a lot of bad. And I've talked to you about this. Mm -hmm. Like this is kind of a conflict that I have. Um, Because especially like from a kid perspective, there's a lot that it can go, it can go wrong. But to your point of like people are at the dinner table and everybody's on their phone and that's just kind of the norm now because it's easier, right? It's like easier for everybody to just be on their phone. It's also addictive. Um, you watched the social dilemma, right? I did so good. Yeah. It's so good. I highly recommend it. And there's this scene in the, and it's a doc, but they also kind of acted out and where they're all around the dinner table. And she's like, Nope, get rid of the phones. And it's like very challenging for the children to get rid of the phones. And I, I found that very fascinating just because I don't have kids. I'm not around teenagers. I don't know. For me, I'm 30, almost 36. It's easy. I'm like, Oh yes, I'm in that generation of like, please, can we not have phones at the table? I want to have conversation. It drives me nuts when Dustin's on his phone. He's real at so he always has to be. But for our kids to not have, my concern comes into the like comparing aspect of it and the false um, livelihood and images that kids yeah. are like thinking they need to be. But also the lack of conversation and connection is just, I Googled today, um, tech detox centers. Cause I'm like, maybe that's something I want to open one day. You know, I just feel like we're going to need more of that. But if people could just do it to your point, 10 minutes, let's put our phones away and let's do a little share at dinner. Yeah. So I was just in a medical conference uh, two weeks ago, and it was really interesting because this woman spoke about 
um, the developing child's brain and the impact technology is having on the developing child's brain. And she also pulled up all these statistics about like 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, the beginning 2000s to like present time and the use of drugs that kids or teenagers are using between the eighth grade and 12th grade. And since technology has entered, drug use has completely skyrocketed. Anxiety and depression and ADD has completely skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. And, um, there's been a lot of studies that show that just being on your phone, like social media for an hour a day, because of the amount of like dopamine hits that you get, which is that reward where you like want to keep going back. And maybe it's like even negative feedback. Maybe it's not like, Oh, this was great. It's like, but what's end up also ends up happening is GABA, which is actually a neurotransmitter that calms down the brain. So in small amounts, it can like reduce anxiety. It actually showed that like too much exposure to electronics makes GABA go so incredibly high that it actually ends up leading to anxiety and greater signs mm -hmm. of depression. And I mean, I just, you know this cause you and I talk, but, um, I've never been on social media. I mean, I was the person that would post on Facebook like twice a year and only kind of did it. Cause people would be like, you know, you travel all over the place, you know, post something. And it was a different patient who was like, I challenge you to, she's like, you really need to start doing social media posts. And I was like, like on Instagram, and I was like, no, 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 no. And she's like, I, I challenge you. She's like 90 days. And I was like, you know what? I'm always challenging my patients. Like, who am I to not right. accept a challenge? You yeah. know, yeah. I'm just going to do it. And I have to tell you, I am very mentally, emotionally balanced and stable and on point. And when I opened up the Instagram account and started to post um, it wasn't even my posting. It wasn't like posting and then seeing if people liked it or not. That was super easy. It was more that what ended up happening is I'd crawl into bed and I would just, if I felt this like need to connect, cause I love connecting with people. And if, you know, people weren't available either like physically in the house or like friends weren't available or something, let's say I was like alone or I just felt the need to connect mm -hmm. or maybe I was like really excited one day. Maybe it was even something as simple as going on a walk and I was listening to a great song. And then I just like wanted to connect with somebody. If, if a person wasn't available, if the outlet wasn't available, I'd go on to Instagram and I just freaking start scrolling. Yep. And then, you know, a freaking hour goes by yep. and you're like, oh my God, what has happened? Now your brain's been freaking poisoned by, <laughs> by everything that's out there. Yeah. I mean, I've never online shopped. I online shopped. I was <laughs> like, you know, all of a sudden started researching random things. I was like, I gotta get off of this thing. You know, it's yeah. like, it's fucking scary. I know. I know. Yeah. It's a weird, it's a really weird thing. Obviously from a marketing perspective, it works for yeah. like retail. We work with retailers staying in contact with their community. So many brands use it to market. Some do sketchy stuff and some are great, but, yeah. uh, from just a user perspective, it is incredibly easy for an hour to go by. For me, it's TikTok. And here's, what's hard is that, um, I learn a lot too. Like on TikTok, yes. it's kind of like the short YouTube. So you get really quick YouTube videos and I learn a lot, but there's also a lot of trash and stuff that spins me out of control. And Dustin will be like, Oh my God, you need to delete the app. Cause I'll be like, have you heard about this? And I'm just like, you know, freaking out about something. And then the next day I'm fine. But then I love it. Cause I can learn about cryptocurrency. Cause there's just so many people creating amazing content that I can't find anywhere else. So I can learn from them. So it's this w hard thing of like, balancing it or knowing who to just look at, not just aimlessly scrolling. Um, it's, it's a really weird world I think that we live in. And I just, I mentioned this on a previous podcast with my mentor, who's got a 18 year old and you know, she was like, they're, you know, in front of the camera doing all these dances and stuff. And I'm like, man, I just miss the days of like bike riding and being outside, you know, and, no phones. And she's like, but this is their bike riding. Like they don't know any different. And I'm like, yeah. well, that is true. And but then is it healthy? Does... I mean, I don't know the answer right. to that. The right. question is, 
Right. You know? So I know you're the interviewer, but I do have a question for you. Okay. That's, that's super raw. If you were to create your own social media platform, something like an Instagram or I'm not familiar with TikTok, but like a TikTok or something where you feel like maybe there's an educational piece, a fun piece, a marketing piece. Like, I don't know. Like, do you, have you had any thoughts about like what you would create? Yeah, I have. Um, and I, I texted my friend Vi, who also does my website, and I'm like, how expensive would this be? <laughs> it's going to be really <laughs> expensive. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I don't know. What I see today value in is groups, like communities of similar mm -hmm. interests. And so like to my point about being on TikTok for crypto, but then other stuff comes through that is not healthy or it's just pure entertaining. It's not educational. And so, um, I think that there just needs to be something that I also would love to see what a platform looked like without an algorithm. And I feel like people would, will think I'm ridiculous for saying that. And I might even feel like that, but if I watch this, you know, months from now or whatever, but algorithms control, they control mm -hmm. what we see. And so if there, if there were no notifications, if there were no algorithms to where it wasn't addictive and controlling, what you're going to have developers say is, well, then you don't have a business idea, right? Like, how are you going to get people to come back? The whole thing is it's got to be sticky. You've got it, people have to constantly come back. But I do feel like if you knew that that's what's hard right now is like, what's the truth online? Right. Like what is real? I, I don't know what to believe and anybody can be a content creator right now. So, yep. um, and nobody looks at credentials anymore, which is so fascinating to me. Like even in my world of like medicine, it's like, people are like, take this and I'll have a patient call me. And they're like, yeah, I took this. I saw it on Instagram. And I'm like, that will destroy you. Like you shouldn't be taking that. Exactly. So, oh my so gosh. They believe nobody, but believe everybody. It's like, yeah. Yep. Well, I, I am a researcher just two days ago, somebody on TikTok, um, he's a nurse and he's like on all these wires for COVID and it really fucked him up. And so I'll go in this state of like, I'm healthy. I'm fine to like, Oh dear, I'm terrified about COVID. Like all these things because I'm consuming all this content. So I decide to research him more and I go and I look back at all of his TikToks. It's like, who the hell has time for this? But I'm just, did it. I'm very curious. He has several pre um, pre existing conditions, um, that are pretty serious. And so now he's dealing with that, which really sucks. And it probably didn't, wouldn't have happened without COVID, but it's like for the average person who is healthy, like me, who has no pre consistent, I keep saying that pre existing, um, <laughs> existing <laughs> conditions. <Yeah. laughs> um, but it's creating fear. And how yeah. many people are watching that being like, fuck, I could be hooked up to all these wires if I get COVID. Yeah. No, I mean, he's got serious issues, but he doesn't say it in his video. So anyways, my whole point is like, there's a lot of fear. There's a lot of misinformation and that really worries me. So, you know, back to your question of a platform, there's a lot to work out there. I really do wish that it could just be a place that almost like matches us, like, you know, eHarmony or match.com or something, but matches people to have conversations and to connect and build friendships online that might even move into like in-person relationships, you know, like something that there's community. I think people really are looking for community. And like you said, yeah. you're going to bed, you want connection. Yep. You know, like I think a lot of people feel that way. So are you familiar with clubhouse? I am. Okay. I, a friend invited me into it. I haven't really explored it, but it appears off first glance that it may be something similar to what you're. Yeah. Suggesting. In a way that can be because you can join different groups, you know, like different kind of interests. They're more like okay. groups right now. Um, but it's the thing where it's different is that's like 
live. You've got to show up and attend to be a part of it. And I think that's hard oh, okay. for people. Um, and it's audio based where I feel like people do uh, audio for sure is our future. But I think from a like connection standpoint, we also want to see pictures and like have little side conversations and you can't do that on the app today, mm. but could okay. they move into that? Totally. For sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, it'd be nice to like even do video like this, you know, like it's just nice to, I don't know. My mom used to always say when you can look somebody in the whites of their eyes, like you actually can, you know, feel their soul. And there's something about yeah. that. And there's something yeah. about being able to see somebody, not just like hear them, although you can get a, a lot of feeling off of hearing somebody, but seeing them and feeling like their essence and who they are and are they truthful? And, you know, I yeah. don't know. There's, I think, value to that. I completely agree. Yeah. So we'll see. Maybe we build an app, Michelle. Okay, that let's do it. Cool. Yeah, <laughs> let's do it. Okay. So I, I sent you a question ahead of time of what podcast are you listening to? But you're not a big podcast person, but I also said book. And then the book that you said, which I love. So what is your, what's one of your favorite books or your most recommended book? Okay. My, one of my favorite books is by Dr. Joe Dispenza and it's Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Um, I just love him as a human and I love what he's here to provide the world. And, um, I've been to several of his advanced retreats. Um, but that book, it found, it found me like mm -hmm. I was heading to Hawaii. I don't know, seven years ago ish. And I walked into a store in Encinitas and I just, I saw the title and I was like, I don't even know what this book's about. I'm going to buy it. Like who doesn't want to break the habit of being exactly. yourself? Right. I love me. I love my life. I love what I've created. But if I can create more greatness, that means to a certain degree, I have to change my personality to change my personal reality. And um, I don't know. I picked up the book and I felt like this man and I were speaking the same language, downloading the same information from the quantum field. And I was just like, I don't know who this guy is, but I resonate with you. And it is my most recommended book to patients, to friends, to family members. I highly encourage it. I think it is on Audible now. Um, and I would just look into his work. I mean, we originally yeah. started this conversation about how can people be resilient, whether it's death, whether it's trauma, whether it's, you know, moving into a different sense of self or, you know, we're stirring things up, you know, with COVID, who do we want to be? And right. he really facilitates a space where you can dive deeper into you and get clear about who you want to be, but then you have to be willing to break some of the habits of being you. You have to be willing to let go of your identity um, and parts of your reality, but that's okay because you get to create what it is you truly want to align with. Right. Yeah. You recommended that book to me and I read it, but I okay. stopped at like page Two two hundred and sixty or something because <laughs> I thought you were gonna say two. <laughs> <laughs> I read the first page. <laughs> Just the one, and then that's it. Um, no, I love the beginning. I remember like going out to breakfast with Dustin. I'm like, oh, and then I love to just like share anything that I'm learning. But I stopped reading, and then about six months ago, a ladies' mastermind group that I'm in. I was sharing stuff and one of the ladies was like, have you read Dr. Joe Dispenza's Breaking the Habit of Being You? Or I always mess up the title. What is it? Breaking the Habit uh, of Being... Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Yourself. And yeah. I'm like, oh my God, I have the book. So I started reading it again just a couple weeks ago. It's on my bedside table. So um, I need to go... It Truly, truly, anybody listening to this, it's a pretty amazing book. Dr. Joe Dispenza, I've, wa I've watched a lot of his Instagram um, videos because he, you know, he's got those bite sized stuff that just kind of helps you understand it quick too. Mm. But uh, it's pretty amazing. You said, um, I wanted to say it again. What was it? Um, it's, it's like personalized to, we're going to probably cut this part, but there was a, what does he say to, Oh, you have to change your personality to change your personal reality. I do think he says that too. Oh, okay. I've, I've said that for years. Oh my God. Yeah. And, and I, he, I'm pretty sure he says that too. Um, I feel like my mom said that to me once, like as a kid, she used to always be like, do what you've always done, get what you've always got. And it used to drive me insane 
be, I don't know. It's just like one of those things that you just hate right. hearing. And right. I feel like she said that to me as a kid. Like, if you want to change your personal reality, you got to change your personality. <laughs> I mean, that's good though. It's yeah. so true. It's so true. Yeah. Oh, great suggestion. Love it. Okay. We'll link to all of these resources that we talk about on um, today's show. Michelle, this has yes. been amazing. I want to end today's show with any final advice that you may have or tips or whatever you feel like you would like to share as we conclude today's episode. I think my advice that goes along with everything we've been talking about is take 15, 20 minutes to yourself every day, just you not sending off that email, connecting in with so-and-so, whatever, like where you just connect in with you. Because I think that every one of us has something to discover every day. And mm -hmm. sometimes it's just sitting in like total peace and gratitude. Other times it's, you know, munching on a problem. And I'm not saying keep in that emotional hit of the problem, but be like, okay, if I want to feel this way and I'm feeling that way, what do I need to do to get back to feeling this way? You know, to truly learn how to problem solve for ourselves. So connecting in with yourself every day would be my advice. Whatever you need to do to connect in with yourself every day. Yeah. And I think people could find 10 to 15 minutes, right? That's absolutely, that's yeah. a doable thing. I yeah. love it. It's a powerful four hours powerful. in the day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Doable and powerful. Just yeah. 10 to 15 minutes. Love it. Great advice. Um, if people want to learn more about you, where should they go? Um, okay. So I am revamping everything, my website, and I'm learning Instagram world, how to be um, effective. <laughs> but currently you could go to drmichellewolford.com, which is my uh, current website. And um, I think it's the same for Instagram, just Dr. Michelle Wolford. And then, um, yeah, it's got email, phone numbers, and just a little bit about me. And then that will be updated. So um, my a lot of my patients call me the sage and the scientist because mm -hmm. I am very scientific-oriented. I have traditional medical school training, but integrated into that was alternative ways of healing the body. So I am a naturopathic doctor. Um, and I very much believe in the power and the wisdom and the healing art of nature and, um, so I very much incorporate those two aspects into one. So, which is really powerful. Yeah. I, I know from experience <laughs> and even like at the very least follow Michelle on Instagram. I even just your IGTV, she'll share some tips that you're, it's like simple stuff that you had no idea. I loved, you were like, Oh, I wanted to ask you too. You're non-negotiable. You're health non-negotiable. This is an easy answer for you oh, is meditate. I meditate yeah. an hour and a half every morning and oh, it doesn't do have you? to be that. Long. I do an hour and a half Wow! and it doesn't have to be that long, but it is my non-negotiable because if you go into a meditation and you're just having one of the day, those days where you're like, I'm tired or, you know, you're just kind of like, I'm like, no, 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 no. You have the power to create whatever you want in your life. So mm -hmm. if you're going to dive into a meditation, you need to ask yourself, what do I want to create? And it's a great way to catch yourself in those bad moods, bad energy, bad moments, and really be like, no, I'm powerful. I am so freaking powerful. And so are you. So that is my non-negotiable. That and castor oil packs. <laughs> oh, which I do every night because of you. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Which share with our listeners what that is. Okay. Sorry. So castor oil is a bean that comes from Peru. It's very viscous. And if you rub a little bit of oil, um, I usually rub it on my liver. So that's below your right breast or right pectoral muscle and all throughout your abdomen in a clockwise direction. Um, it's very detoxifying. It brings all of the white blood cells to the area. And we have these little macrophages that are like Pac-Man that come and eat any sort of toxic material put it into the lymphatic system, which is like our drainage pipes. So it's a great way to detoxify, relax your nervous system, move your bowels, um, help with cholesterol management. So it's, it's phenomenal and it's easy and it's inexpensive and it works. Totally. Yep. 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 Yeah. I love doing those. Yeah. So good. Oh my gosh. You have shared so much with us today. <laughs> I am so incredibly grateful for your time, for your wisdom, for you just opening up with us. One last cheers. Thank you so oh, much. Absolutely. Thank you for cheers. having me. 
We will link to all of Michelle's information everywhere online and um, through all the podcast players. Again, Michelle, this was such a fun experience. And really, I feel like we could have you on like a, 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 many more times if you'll do it. I would love to have you back. There's a lot There's a lot that we could talk about. Um, all right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode. I'll see you on the next See You. And thank you, Michelle. Bye. Bye, you guys. Thank you so much for listening. Are you on Instagram? I'd love to see pictures of you listening to the show, a screenshot of your favorite episode and or your favorite wines. Share them with me. Just follow and tag at Crystal Uncorked. I can't wait to see you there. All right. I'll see you on the next See You.